Hello everyone and welcome to the latest of Field Fisher's privacy webinar series. Today we are covering anonymization and pseudonymization. My name is Hazel Grant and I head up the data privacy team based out of our London office. Thank you very much for joining us today. I'm joined by a couple of colleagues, Rob Fett and Min Datu, who are also from our London office. And in a few moments, I will ask them to introduce themselves. First of all, though, let's just briefly consider our topic. Many of you will be aware that anonymization is the silver bullet as far as GDPR compliance is concerned. If you can only say that the personal data you hold has been properly anonymized, then you no longer need to comply with the GDPR. But how do you achieve anonymization in a compliant fashion? That's what we're going to discuss today. We'll also be touching on pseudonymization, where obvious identifiers are removed and replaced with codes so that the resulting data set will not identify an individual in the real world unless you hold those cold codes. That's not quite the silver bullet, but pseudonymization has long been a privacy enhancing technique approved of by data protection regulators. So today's session will also look at that technique. So before we go any further, I'm just going to ask my fellow presenters to say a few words to introduce themselves. Uh, Rob, can you say hello to the audience? Hello everyone, uh, I'm Robert Fett, currently based in the London office, but soon to be moving to our California office. Uh, it's lovely to talk to you all today. Thanks so much, Rob. Min? Hi everyone, my name is Min Harlan. I'm also based in the London office. Um, I'm a solicitor working jointly across the technology, outsourcing and privacy team at Field Fisher's London office, having qualified into the team last summer. Thank you, Hazel. Thanks, Min. So briefly, for those of you who don't already know us, Field Fisher is an international law firm with offices across Europe and, as you've heard, in Silicon Valley and also in China. Our privacy team works across all of those offices and we are a collaborative team providing strategic and actionable privacy solutions. And I know you're going to hear about that in this webinar. Turning to housekeeping, please do ask us questions using the question function on your screen. Uh, we have left a little bit of time to cover those as we're going along um, and we will also leave some time at the end to cover questions then. If we don't manage to cover them all, we will reply to you, so fear not, you will get an answer from us. We will finish promptly in just under an hour at 5.30 UK time. Later this week, we will also send you a copy of the slides and a recording, so please don't feel that you have to scribble everything down or tap away on your PC taking notes. A couple of other points, please do subscribe to our blog and do keep an eye out for more of our webinars over the coming weeks and months. Uh, lastly, if you would like to take our Field Fisher Get, Get DP Fit course, then subscribe to our channel on YouTube. You'll find those details in the email when we send out the follow up from today's session. So let's briefly turn to the agenda slide and work out what we're going to cover today. So my colleagues are going to touch on some really interesting questions, which I know you're going to find uh, fascinating. First of all, we're going to look at the advantages of anonymization. And also, what do we actually mean by anonymization, which is probably one of the toughest nuts to crack. Uh, recently, we've seen guidance from uh, the CNIL about processes using data for product improvements. So this is a real practical issue. Can processes use anonymized data for product improvement? And then a couple of other points that I think are often forgotten. So how can you demonstrate good governance and accountability to regulators when you've actually carried out anonymization? And some practical steps. And then finally, we'll turn to Q&A. So, I think for my next slide, I need to turn over to Min, who's going to take us through the advantages of anonymization. Thank you, Hazel. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. 
So both the ICO and the Irish DPC have given us a list of advantages with regards to using anonymous data, and these have been split into different types of advantages. So firstly, we've got some general advantages, which are firstly, anonymization limits your data protection risks, and it can enable you to make information available to other organizations or to the public. The ICO says that anonymous information is no longer personal data, and therefore the principles of data protection will do not apply when you process it. Secondly, Anonymous data supports the core principle of data minimization. If you process personal data, you have to comply with the data protection principles and be able to demonstrate how you do so. The principles regulate the disclosure of personal data and establish a framework through which you can do this fairly, lawfully, and transparently. Thirdly, it's generally easier to disclose anonymous information rather than personal data as fewer legal restrictions apply. It's also easier to use anonymous information in new and different ways as the data protection rules on purpose limitation do not apply to this use. And finally, if anonymous data is re-identified following a data breach, it could potentially not be classified as a data breach for the purposes of ICO investigation. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? And the ICOs also list in their guidance some specific use advantages which are really valuable to hone into. So firstly, implementing effective anonymization can help you to better understand the legal requirements about the information you hold and intend to share or disclose. It can also improve your decision-making and risk reduction and management processes throughout your organization. Effective anonymization can also help you to adopt a data protection design by design approach, and it can also help to protect individuals' identities when processing data in your organization. It can also help to reduce reputational risks caused by inappropriate or insecure disclosure or publication of personal data. And it can also reduce questions, complaints, or disputes about your disclosure of information derived from personal data. Lastly, it can also develop greater confidence in publishing anonymous information in a rich, reusable format, and it can help you to navigate potentially challenging issues, such as when handling freedom of information requests involving specific amounts of personal data. And we can go to the next slide, please. Very interestingly, the ICO guidance also touches on the wider use advantages of using anonymous data. So firstly, it helps to develop greater public trust and confidence that the data is being used for the public good while privacy is being protect protected. So for example, by ensuring legally required safeguards are in place and being complied with, with specific prescriptions of anonymous data and how to use it. Greater transparency as a result of organizations being able to make anonymous information more widely available is also listed as a wider use benefit. It also incentivizes researchers and others to use anonymous information instead of personal data wherever this is possible for the organization. There's also economic and societal benefits deriving from the availability of rich data sources, which can essentially lead to great discoveries in the fields of scientific research as a specific use case example. And finally, it also lists an advantage of improved public authority accountability through better availability of information about service outcomes and improvements. Uh, next slide, please. So conversely, we'd also like to discuss the advantages of pseudonymization, and it's helpful to look at the advantages of this specifically uh, next to those that are considered next to anonymization. So in general, when properly applied, pseudonymization can help you to reduce the risk of your processing and the risk that that processing poses to individual rights. And we've got a quote from the GDPR up on the screen there, which says that the application of pseudonymization to personal data can reduce the risk to the data subjects concerned. It can also enhance the security of the personal data you process. Pseudonymization techniques can reduce the risk of harm to individuals that may arise from personal data breaches. In turn, that this can also form part of your assessment of the likelihood and severity of any impact of a personal data breach. It also supports the reuse of personal data for new purposes. For example, data protection law may allow repurposing of personal data for some types of processing if appropriate safeguards such as pseudonymization are in place. In research, further analysis of compatible purposes, this is clearly shown and does not mean pseudonymization automatically allows you to undertake this further processing in all cases. However, it can be an important way to demonstrate your organization how you protect personal data if you do so. It also supports your overall compliance with the data protection principles that we've mentioned earlier. And finally, 
it can help to build individuals' trust and confidence in how you process their data within your organization. And next slide, please. So prior to our webinar, we posted a poll on our LinkedIn profile. And the question we pose to our audience is, companies often want to reuse data subjects, personal data for product improvement purposes. And we asked our audience what approach is taken. And as you can see from the results on the screen, anonymizing data is the clear winner in terms of what approach organizations and individuals take in such the regard. So but what does it mean exactly to anonymize personal data? I'll pass over now to Rob to discuss this for more details. Thanks, Min. Uh, so next slide, please. So before we get into the weeds of how we can use anonymous data, we need to understand what it is and what it is not. So what it is not is encryption. Encryption can be a useful pseudonymization tool, but it is not an anonymization tool. This is because, although in theory, the deletion of the encryption key could render um, data anonymous, Practically, one cannot assume that encrypted data cannot be decrypted because of the strength of the encryption algorithm and of the key information leaks, implementation issues, the amount of encrypted data, and also technological advances such as quantum computing. Next slide, please. So now on to what anonymization actually is. And I think there are two key points to understand. Firstly, Unlike the definition of personal data in the GDPR, which we all know and love, Article 4 of the GDPR does not define anonymous data. However, Recital 26 is the starting point from which the guidance is built on. It makes the point that anonymous information is not personal data, but more importantly, it states that accounts should be taken of all the means reasonably likely to be used and the objective factors when trying to work out whether data is uh, personal data or anonymous data. Next slide, please. And secondly, it's also clear from the guidance that you do not need to guarantee that anonymization will be carried out perfectly in order to consider data to be anonymous. There's always going to be an inherent risk of re-identification. So that's something that's really worth bearing in mind. The ICO says that whether something is personal data or anonymous data, is an outcome of assessing its identifiability risk, taking into account the relevant facts, and that in practice, identifiability may be viewed as a spectrum, with personal data at one end and anonymized data at the other end. It then goes on to say that for everything in between, identifiability depends on the specific circumstances and the risks posed. Essentially, information may move along the spectrum of identifiability, to the point that data protection starts to apply or conversely data protection law um, stops applying to this data. So ultimately there is an element of subjectivity involved and basically having to make a call as to whether you can justify the data as being anonymized. And so with that in mind let's go on to discuss what factors should be taken into account when carrying out such an assessment. Next slide please. So both the ICO and the DPC have come up with a detailed list of factors to consider when assessing whether data is anonymous or not. Some of these are listed above. Later in this webinar, I'll be talking about how organizations can go about this assessment as part of their accountability and governance obligations. But for now, I just wanted to spend a few minutes picking out some of these points in more detail. Next slide, please. So first, let's discuss um, perspective and context. This is incredibly important to your overall assessment. Understanding whether your organization fits, um, you know, what, what its data flows are, um, who else data is being shared with, and what other data is available, will help you to understand where the risks lie in re-identifying data. For example, whether other parties will be able to link your data to other data, um, who a motivated intruder might be, and what your technical and organizational security environment will be. These are all factors that should be considered uh, in more detail. And so this is really just the starting point of your assessment and kind of what you would also do in a data protection impact assessment as well. Next slide, please. The second factor we'll consider is the motivated intruder. Now, the motivated intruder test has been a feature of data protection law for many years, 
The purpose of it is to understand who might be motivated enough to try to re-identify the data and what sources they would have to do so. It's helpful because it allows you to calibrate your analysis to the specific risks relating to the data in question and your particular organization. It also, when we think about where the bar is um, for the motivated intruder, um, the bar is set higher than simply considering whether a relatively inexpert member of the public could achieve re-identification, but it's set lower than considering whether somebody with access to significant special ex specialist expertise, analytical power, or prior knowledge could do so. The motivated intruder must have motive to attempt the identification, the means to succeed, and the intent to use the data in ways that pose risks to your organization and to individuals. So just to take um, a silly example, so practically what it means is that you don't have to automatically consider, for example, that motivated intruder could be you know, a state intelligence agency with you know, access to all sorts of resources when trying to uh, de-anonymize the data, um, particularly if the data you're considering is fairly benign data that would be of no interest um, to such an organization. However, um, another example would be um, considering resources of a journalist. So if the information you have is very newsworthy, perhaps it's about a public figure, then that's the kind of resources you might need to consider. Another example given by the ICO um, concerns health data, and it considers the embarrassment or anxiety that could be caused by re-identification, even though there may be no obvious motivation to re-identify that patient. The ICO specifically states that the anonymization techniques employed to protect this data need to reflect the potential harms. And I'll come back to this example shortly in the context of professional obligations. But keeping on the health theme in relation to the motivated intruder, I want to draw your attention to one more example from the ICO. It gives the example of an employee who works out that a particular absence statistic relates to a colleague who they know is on long-term sick leave. And it questions whether that employee would learn something new or whether it's something already known to that employee. The ICO states that the relevant factor is that when somebody could learn something new, um, this suggests that it reduces the risk level as part of the assessment. So in other words, if the anonymized data is disclosed to somebody who already knew it anyway, um, it would not stop the information from being anonymous to somebody who didn't already know it. Next slide, please. Third, let's consider um, data linkage. Any linking of identifiers in a data set will make it more likely uh, that, an that an individual will be identifiable. A simple example given by the DPC, which illustrates this point, is uh, concerning names. Taken individually, the first and the second name, John and Smith, might not be capable of distinguishing one of a large company's customers from its other customers. But if those two pieces of information are linked, it is far more likely that John Smith will refer to a unique identifiable individual. And of course, the more identifiers that are linked together in a data set, for example, an office location, a year of birth, a job title, the more likely it is that the person to whom they relate will be identified or identifiable. A major risk factor to consider, therefore, is that the information your organization holds could be combined with information from third parties, including public sources, uh, which could identify the individual. Next slide, please. One of the other factors to consider is inferences. In some cases, it may be possible to infer a link between two pieces of information in a, data, in a set of data, even though the information is not expressly linked. The RHDBC gives the example of a data set concerning statistics regarding the seniority and pay of the employees of a company. Although such data would not point directly to the salaries of individuals in the data set, an inference might be drawn between two pieces of information, allowing some individuals to be identified. The ICO gives some further color to this example, um, or, or this factor. When considering the likelihood of identifiability through inference, the ICO says that organizations need to consider the possibility of deducing the identity of individuals from incomplete data sets, uh, for example, where some of the identifying information has been removed or generalized, 
from pieces of information in the same data set that are not obviously or directly linked, or from other information that they either possess or may reasonably be expected to obtain. The ISO guidance also states that organizations should also consider whether the specific knowledge of others, such as doctors, family members, friends and colleagues, could be sufficient additional information that may allow inferences to be drawn. Next slide, please. So the final uh, factor that we'll consider today is that of contracts and professional obligations. This factor may form part of the motivated intruder test, but it can also form part of the general assessment as to um, identifiability. Returning back to the example I gave earlier of health data, although the data itself, um, health data poses a higher risk, um, one may conclude that, for example, doctors are unlikely to be a motivated intruder because of their professional, uh, ethical and confidentiality obligations to a patient. So there are a lot of other factors that we could go into today. Um, we don't have time to cover these um, in this webinar. But these factors are all things to consider when carrying out an assessment as to whether um, data is anonymous, anonymous or not. And such an assessment could be part of your DPIA process, but it could also be a separate exercise. And so what you might want to do is carry out an anonymization assessment. And we're working on a template um, which we can um, sort of tailor to specific organizations. Um, and, and that sort of template and that kind of process can help organizations to carry out that analysis. And so with that, I'll go back to Min to talk about product improvement. Thank you, Rob. So the third part of our agenda today will cover the topic of whether processes can use anonymized data for product improvement purposes. If we can go to the next slide, please. So this is something that we've seen become quite a hot topic in practice, and it's something we've seen become increasingly popular. So for example, we might see a SaaS provider or just another general type of service provider wanting to use personal data provided to them as a processor for the use of their own product improvement purposes. Generally, however, the reuse of personal data an organization receives as a processor under the GDPR for the processor's own purposes sits uneasily with the binary control of the processor framework under the GDPR, which of course has several restrictions prescribed for that relationship. The GDPR limits processes to use personal data only on behalf of the relevant controller and in accordance with the controller's specific documented instructions, except as otherwise required by applicable EU or member state law. However, Organizations that reuse personal data for independent purposes run straight into key areas of GDPR uncertainty. So this begs the question, can processors actually use anonymized data for product improvement purposes? Sadly, there's no specific ICO guidance on this topic yet on the use of anonymized data for product improvement purposes. However, one could infer that guidance could be on the way because such a use case is envisaged in the draft guidance from the ICO. As you see the quote on your screen, where in part one of their anonymization guidance, the ICO has said, anonymization is a privacy friendly way to harness the potential of data, including when developing new and innovative products and services. The French Data Protection Authority, the SNEAL, has recently released guidance on this topic in January 2022 on parameters for reuse of product improvement data and anonymous data throughout the course of it. If we could go to the next slide, please. So essentially, what the Keneal's guidance on the product improvement use cases says is that processors can reuse personal data for their own purposes, but strictly only under two conditions. These two conditions, as on the screen, are firstly, where the original controller grants explicit permission, and secondly, where the new purpose is compatible with the original purpose for processing. There's also other restrictions and guidance that the Keneal guidance has put on this situation. So processors must specify how and why personal data will be reused and to ensure that their customer agreements grant sufficient permission for this in any contractual agreement between the two parties. The Keneal also emphasizes that if the compatibility test is not satisfied, the controller must refuse to authorize the reuse of data for the processor, whereas if the test is satisfied, the controller is free to agree or not. The controller must also conduct compatibility analysis only where the initial processing was grounded in a legal basis other than consent. 
It should also be noted that the controller's authorization for any repurposing of data by its processor must be provided on a case-by-case -case basis, so it cannot be given generally for all use cases. The controller specifically and authoritatively must give case-by-case -case approval for such use. The CNU also provides a useful example, as you can see on the screen, in its guidance, stating that in a case where a processor wants to reuse data for the purpose of improving its cloud computing services, such reuse could be considered compatible with the initial processing, subject to appropriate guarantees, such as the anonymization of the data, if this identifying data is not necessary. And finally, the guidance also re raises a key point and clarifies that once it processes data for its own purposes, a processor actually becomes a controller in its own right and must comply with the more onerous requirements under the GDPR, which are placed on controllers of personal data. If we could go to the next slide, please. So there's an interesting point to unpack from the CNIL guidance, and that's how to address this contractually. And while, as I mentioned previously, there has not been any guidance from the ICA specifically on the product improvement scenario, there are some considerations that we have to give as to how to address this contractually. It raises questions such as, does the use need to be drawn into the DPA? Does it need to be considered in the privacy notice? Or is there any need to say anything at all? So this is arguably a risk-based approach and one that organizations shouldn't take lightly, but should reflect onto their own security measures internally and appropriately in terms of the contractual agreements they have in place with several parties and any controllers. So I'll now hand over back to Rob to talk us through governance and accountability. Thanks, Vin. Um, so um, I want to talk about governance and accountability. So the ICO's latest draft guidance is clear that establishing an appropriate governance structure can help reduce the risk of enforcement action, including fines, particularly if you have made a serious efforts to comply with data protection law and had a genuine reason to believe that the information was not personal data. In other words, some appropriate documentation demonstrating how you came to the conclusion that data was anonymous might be your get out of jail free card in the event of an investigation. So in addition to documenting your anonymization assessment and DPIAs, other governance structures can mitigate the risk to your organization. Firstly, you can ask yourself and document uh, with appropriate policies, the people and the organizations who will be part of the anonymization process. So this could include um, people and different roles within your organization. Uh, it can also include uh, trusted third parties who may assist you with the anonymization process. One possibility suggested by the ICO is to appoint a senior information risk owner within the organization. And this person would take on the responsibility for key decisions regarding anonymization, such as consulting with the DPO and identifying the corporate approach to anonymization drawing on relevant experience uh, within your organization, uh, within industry, and so on. And of course, appropriate training within uh, your organization is really key. So documenting who within your organization has received training about anonymization, um, how that applies to their role, that can be part of your policies and your documentation um, to show to a regulator. Secondly, what measures um, do you have in place to safeguard data and to identify and manage difficult cases? This ties in with the appropriate technological and organizational measures, which you should have in place in any case for personal data under GDPR. But now we're considering um, how these might also apply to anonymous data. Having similar measures for anonymized data can therefore also help you to reduce the risk of re-identification. Thirdly, um, consider how technology could help or hinder you in documenting this. So, for example, part of your assessment as to whether um, data is going to be anonymous will consider the current state of technological development, um, but also how that technology may um, evolve over time, such that potentially it could cause the anonymized data to be re-identified. So an important aspect will actually be documenting what kind of technology is available at the current time, 
and obviously reviewing this information um, on a regular basis, keeping it updated so that you can continue to justify the fact that under the current state of um, technology, the data would not be able to be re-identified. And also relating to this, um, having in place some testing procedures. So when you're anonymizing data, carrying out appropriate testing to kind of you know double check that it actually is anonymous, um, perhaps applying different technologies um, and just try to document what kind of testing you're carrying out. Um, and the fact that you know you're finding that it um, can't be re-identified or, or there's um, there's a low risk of, of that occurring um, that can form a very crucial part of your documentation to show to data protection authorities. And um, the fourth factor to, to consider as part of your governance and accountability is which the ICO identifies is transparency to data subjects. Now, anonymization um, is an act of processing and therefore, according to the GDPR, um, should be disclosed in a privacy policy. So actually telling data subjects that you're going to carry out that process of anonymization um, because that's something that you are actually carrying out to personal data. Now, in the past, many organizations have taken a sort of a risk-based view on this kind of considering the fact that, well, what you are doing by anonymizing is turning it into something which is no longer personal data and therefore um, not covered by the GDPR. And also the fact that what you're doing is something which adds an extra layer of protection and is safeguarding the data subject. So some organizations have in the past taken the view, well, actually, you know, let's not disclose the fact that we are anonymizing the data, for example, for product improvement purposes. Um, because an organization may not want to kind of alert data subjects and other parties to the fact that that is being carried out. Um, you might not want those questions, but um, sort of this element of transparency is something which is um, noted by the ICO as being important. Um, and so, for example, in the context of processes using data for product improvement, um, you know, if you do disclose this as part of your privacy notice, um, that could be seen by the ICO as sort of mitigating um, circumstances in the event that data was um, anonymous, uh, re identified at a later time. And it can kind of help to demonstrate that, um, you know, you had that sort of belief that the data you had um, was um, properly anonymized. So that's um, perhaps something to reconsider. Um, when drafting privacy notices in the future. And so with that, I will turn to Min again to kind of summarize some of the practical steps. Thank you, Rob. So for this part of the webinar, we'd like to discuss some of the practical steps that organizations can seek to implement and generally consider based upon what we've spoken about today and the guidance that has been considered. If we could go to the next slide, please. So firstly, organizations should consider carrying out anonymization assessments and DPIAs as appropriate. This is a clear way to assess the impact of the proposed anonymization activities, for example, the use of anonymized data for product improvement purposes, as we've discussed previously. Organizations can also begin the task of reviewing their customer controllers processor contracts. These should be reviewed to see if there's any specific restriction or if any additional provisions need to be discussed. And this covers both scenarios, for example, where the organization is a processor for their customers who are data controllers, or where the organization is a controller who wants to assess what the terms in place are for the suppliers they provide personal data to as their processors. Organizations should also consider updating their privacy notices to refer to anonymized data, specifically any use of anonymized data that the organization plans to undertake, going back again to that product improvement use case that we've discussed previously. Organizations should also consider adopting new policies, governance structures, and conducting staff training to ensure compliance with guidance as appropriate and any laws or regulations that may come into place soon. And finally, organizations should review EDPB guidance on anonymization, which is due to, publish, be, due to be published soon and should be considered in future going forward. And with that, we'll move on to the next slide. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Min and Rob. That was uh, an excellent summary of where we are right now in terms of anonymization and pseudonymization. So um, we have some questions here and uh, I will read out the questions for the benefit of uh, everybody who's uh, on the line. So um, let me pick up the first one that I'm finding uh, and that is, a question to say, what is the most effective form of anonymizing personal data? As often pseudonymized means are confused and suggested. Uh, I think the, the question is saying that um, often people suggest pseudonymization rather than anonymization and what is the most effective form of anonymization. Um, I don't know if Rob Min, you want to uh, say anything given your review of the guidance but whilst you're thinking of that I will start off by saying I think to know exactly what the most effective form of anonymization is it will be very context specific and you will probably need to speak to a statistician to work out what the original data set is and what you want to use the data set for and then work out what form of anonymization would be appropriate. So to take some silly examples, because I am not a statistician, as you might well guess, uh, you know, if you have a detailed set of data involving names and addresses and body mass index and height, etc., you might say, actually, we don't need names and addresses. We can just take that out and we'll have uh, I don't know, 2,000 entries in our data set. So we consider that the risk of actually identifying someone will be very low from simply body mass index, height, weight, uh, I don't know, maybe some other uh, measurements. But you might be use of data requires you to know where someone lives because you're looking at socioeconomic factors and you want to know where someone's home is, and therefore you need to keep some information in there about their home address. And at that point, you may not be able to simply remove certain uh, parts of the data set. You may need to do something slightly different. You may need to do some sort of obfuscation, which is where you kind of throw in noise and change some of it. Uh, so there are various different techniques that are discussed, uh, usually in some of the guidance, certainly at the back of the Article 29 Working Party guidance and also at the back of the original ICO guidance. Uh, but to get real advice on which technique to use, you'd need to speak to a statistician. Uh, Rob, Min, would you want to add anything to that? Um, no, I think you covered it um, perfectly, Hayden. Okay, cool. Um, Next, we have a question from someone saying, why is a DPIA needed? Um, I can take Rob, that one. Can you take that one? That's fabulous. Thank you. Yeah. So, so I think um, the reason I mentioned DPIA was that um, when you're carrying out um, a particular processing activity, um, you know, you might at the beginning be dealing with personal data. You might be using it in a scenario which a DPIA would be required if the data was not anonymized. And potentially, um, as part of that processing, for example, for product improvements, you might say, well, actually, we're going to um, anonymize part of this data and therefore use um, the data in an anonymous form. Um, in a manner which I suppose a DPIA would not be required, um, but it's all part of documenting the fact that, um, you know, whatever processing you're carrying out, um, where, you know, a DPIA would be required, um, you're just a, a small portion of that processing uh, is going to be anonymous and therefore um, you kind of want to justify that as part of your ordinary DPIA process, um, you justify the fact that for this particular portion of data, which perhaps is more high risk, um, you're, you're going to attempt to anonymize it. And so um, a DPIA is, I suppose, is not required for anonymous data, um, but it is required for um, personal data. And so it, it just might form 
um, part of your overall kind of risk assessment and, and your process for whatever processing you're carrying out. Okay, thank you very much, Rob. Okay, moving on to our next question. Um, and this is uh, a question for a sort of a question for our thoughts generally. Um, so the questioner says, I've occasionally heard or read people making a distinction between legal anonymization, e.g. GDPR requirements, versus practical approaches. I don't find this very helpful. Also phrases like truly or properly anonymized. It seems to me that by following well-established frameworks such as ICO or UCAN, you can achieve anonymization that achieves both legal and practical requirements. And then we're asked for our thoughts on that. Um, I, I think I would probably agree with the question here uh, that um, perhaps what people are trying to suggest is that practical approaches may be closer to pseudonymization rather than true anonymization. Uh, and that they hope that by achieving something that is pseudonymization, that perhaps the, uh, the parties involved in the data sharing are happier to use the data. Um, Rob, Min, I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. Um, I think I think it just goes back to sort of the factors we discussed, and um, you know, I think the ICO has been quite helpful, and of course we'll have to see um, what EDPB says um, when it publishes its guidance. I think the ICO is, is quite helpful in you know saying you know take a practical approach. Um, mm -hmm. You're not aiming for perfection, and you know, sort of take all these factors into account. Um, when when trying to sort of ultimately take a risk-based view that's appropriate for your organisation. Yeah, yeah. I, am, I tend to agree with that. And I think something reading through the guidance that I identified, which Rob picked up on there, is that it's very pragmatic and practical for organisational purposes rather than just talking about anonymization in theory. It gives some really good examples and some really good guidance just practically on how to achieve the harmony between the two that the question stated there. So yeah, I agree with um, everything that you said he's one with what Rob said so far. Mm -hmm. So actually, Min, what you're saying is that the way the ICO has set up their guidance, it's it's like a combination of legal and practical anonymization because they've given some real examples on how to achieve anonymization. Yeah, definitely. And I think it'd be really interesting to see what the EDPB guidance says eventually when it comes out. We would hope it would be just as practical as the ICO guidance and hopefully it can give us a bit more information as to how to achieve sort of balance between the two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Um, so, uh, under the UK GDPR, does pseudonymized data still need to be disclosed as part of a data subject access request? If the entity holds the key, I would think yes. If not, then how would we disclose it? So, um, Min, are you able to take that one? Hi, thank you, Hazel. Um, I'm not sure if I've seen that discussed specifically within the guidance that I've read into, um, unless either yourself or Rob have seen something like that occur in practice. I'm not sure that the guidance specifically says it, but I think the the, the fundamental point is that if it's if it is pseudonymized as opposed to anonymized then the entity that holds the key that can unlock the pseudonymized data will have to disclose it as part of a data subject access request because I think it will still fall within the definition of personal data. What they've done by pseudonymizing it is protecting it whilst it's within the business, you know, potentially limiting the number of employees who can see the identifiers, for example. But the legal entity that holds that pseudonymized data as well as the key um, will be considered to be holding personal data. So in my view, I think they're going to have to disclose the, that pseudonymized data as part of a response to a subject access request. Um, they would also, sorry. 
So I was just going to say one example would be clinical trials where, um, you know, the, the party taking it, you know, um, the, the organization who's sort of do, carrying out that clinical trial uh, would only have access to the pseudonymized data um, from the patients, but potentially another party um, who's assisting with that clinical trial um, would sort of have the raw data, and the key to um, sort of unlock that pseudonymized data. So it depends, you know, what the um, sort of agreements between those parties said uh, about you know, what, what happened in the event of uh, subject access request and perhaps whether there was um, a sort of an intermediary such as mm -hmm, um, an independent data protection officer who could kind of have access to that key in order to, um, you know, resolve that data subject access request um, without the organization itself kind of undoing all that pseudonymization itself. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, we still have quite a few questions to get through, so I think we ought to, to move on to the next one. Um, a lot of the guidance mentioned comes from the UK and Irish DPAs. Do other DPAs in the EU and elsewhere take a similar view? Uh, now, I must say that I'm not sure that I'm aware of other DPAs coming up with guidance on anonymization. Rob, Min, did your research show anything like this? Um, um, similar to, you, to what you said, Hazel, yes. The main ones that we've seen, of course, are the four parts so far guidance that the ICOs released on the topic. And there's also yeah. the guidance on the working party that's been released previously and by the Irish EBC. Um, aside from reading into what the French Canal said on the topic of product improvement, there's not a large amount of data protection authority guidance out there on the topic. I believe it's obviously a realm which is becoming more and more popular uh, by organizations wishing to harness the strength of anonymized data. So I wouldn't be surprised if it's impending and we see guidance released imminently for a number of DPAs. But so far, I think the main ones are just the ones that have been discussed so far. The, there is one paper from, uh, it's like a joint paper between the, I think it's the Spanish Authority and the EDPS. Um, which discusses okay. some understandings relating to anonymization. Um, and that kind of reflects um, a sort of similar position to some of the things that ICO and the DPC have said. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, the next question is, do you think it is possible to have a single policy on anonymization that complies across multiple regions? Um, I'm guessing that perhaps is a sort of follow-on question from the, the one we just mentioned about the fact that the guidance so far is UK, Irish and Article 29 Working Party. Um, any thoughts on whether it's possible to have that single policy? Um, I've, I've not seen at the moment anything sort of inconsistent between what the ICO and the DPC have said. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think the key will be the EDPB guidance when it comes out, because that should obviously um, kind of set the tone for all the regulators um, within the EU. Um, so I, th I think we'll have to wait for that to answer that question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um... So at the moment, we're perhaps benefiting from the fact that there's little guidance out there, which may mean that uh, a, a policy across regions is possible right now. Um, OK, um, the next question is, is postcode level data anonymous? Assume 15 households per postcode. Um, I, I'm thinking that that will depend on what sort of data is being attached to the postcode. Uh, I think it's quite difficult to to answer that one in the abstract uh, because you could have, I don't know, one person living in each house or you could have a number of households um, where perhaps there's only one child or one uh, retired person amongst all of those 15 households. I think it's to me, it's quite difficult to know whether or not that is anonymous. I don't know, Rob, Min, whether you think that's right or whether you think there's another way of looking at it. 
uh, I think that's right, Hazel. I think we really need to look at what what is the data that's attached um, to those households. Um, and I think there are a lot of studies which have shown that, you know, just having a few extra data points such as age or uh, gender, for example, would kind of identify and pinpoint a specific person within that within that postcode. Yeah. Okay. So then we move on to some questions about product improvement. And it's a it's a two part question. So the first part is where a controller wishes to use personal data for its own product improvement purposes. Would you suggest that this should be stated explicitly in its privacy notice? Um, I think my view would be yes, because that's a, another purpose for which the data is being used. What do you say, uh, Rob and Min? Yeah, I'm minded to agree, and I think it ultimately comes down to a risk-based approach. Um, as you say, Hazel, it's another use case there with regards to the personal data. So I'd say yes, um, I, I believe it should be addressed in the privacy notice as appropriate. Okay. So then we've got the second second part of the question is, should that privacy notice also inform individuals that the controller will permit use by its processors for product improvement purposes? Um, I think I brought, I'm, I'm going to say something very similar, and I think, Min, you're probably going to say something very similar as well, which is that um, probably it should say that because that is um, a, a transfer of data to a third party, and I think it's what would be expected from the regulators. But Min, I don't know whether you would add something about risk on this point. Yeah, no, I, I agree entirely. And I think ultimately it comes down to what the controller would consider appropriate in terms of satisfying any requirements of the data protection authority. And I think it is a transfer of data to a processor. And ultimately it is, you know, something that mm -hmm. once the risk-based approach has been taken, it could be seen to be needed to be sort of entered into in the privacy notice. Um, but again, I think this is something that organisations should consider, but I'd say off the top of my head, it probably should be added in. Yeah, I think it, I, I think, I think that's what regulators would expect. Whether it is done on a regular basis might be another matter, because I think that people may, may possibly take that risk-based approach on some occasions. So um, let's move on to the next question. Um, we have under GDPR Recital 26, anonymous information is not personal data. Assuming a cloud provider truly anonymizes data, why would there be any limitations to use such data to improve its services? Um, I think that is correct. If, if the data is completely anonymous, reference, you know, earlier questions, i.e. At, uh, at the standard required by the GDPR to be anonymous, then there wouldn't be any limitations on using that anonymized data to improve the services. But I think, as was mentioned earlier on, the actual action of anonymizing the data is processing. So, strictly speaking, that needs to be told to the data subjects that their data will be anonymized in order to be used for product improvement. I don't know if Rob Min, you want to add anything to that? Nothing from me. No, I think, yeah, that's all from me. And I think there is a really important distinction to make there, as Hazel, you said, in terms of there are actually two activities in play, the first being the actual act of anonymizing the data and then the use of the anonymous data for product improvement purposes. So I think, just generally, I would draw attention to the distinction between the two activities there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, then I think, Rob, this is probably for you because it's a question uh, or comment really about the uh, motivated intruder test. And the comment is, it's not easy to reconcile the motivated intruder test with the concept of limited access in the ICO code. I don't know if you have any comments on that. Um, so I think I'm just trying to understand the question a little bit better. I think 
if, if what you're talking about limited access is, you know, within your organization, you know, trying to make sure that um, you know, only a small portion of people have access to um, the data that you're you know, trying to anonymize. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I see that as sort of difficult to reconcile. Um, I, th I think the point is that the fewer um, potential motivated intruders there could be, either within your organization or externally, um, the better. So if you can um, you know, limit access to this anonymized data um, to as few people as possible, I suppose that reduces the risk that somebody in your organization may, um, you know, who, who you know, shouldn't have access to that data is able to access it um, and therefore, you know, try to re-identify it. And similarly, it would sort of reduce the chances of people externally um, from having access to that. Um, for example, because, um, you know, somebody has sent a spreadsheet of data um, to the wrong person. You know, if you're trying to lock down that data um, using those appropriate technical and organizational measures, that's going to reduce the chance of, of lots of different kinds of people having access. Um, and so I think that's sort of part of that motivated intruder test. Okay, thank you. Just looking at time here, I think we're going to have to take a couple of short questions and email out answers for some of the slightly longer questions that we haven't quite got to. Um, so one of the short questions, which I'm hoping Rob or Min, you might know an answer to is, do we know when the EDPP guidance might be published? Have we had any inkling as to when that may come out? Um, I think it's only been mentioned um, sort of on the sort of to-do list by the EDPB. Um, okay. I was looking at the agenda um, of their meetings recently, and I, I didn't sort of see an agenda point in the next meeting um, sort of indicating that it would be kind of discussed and approved. Um, but we know it is sort of in the, in the work, so to speak. So I, I would just sort of keep checking over the next uh, few months. Okay, sounds good. Um, and then um, uh, let's just pick up one of these. You know, let's see if we can just rattle through two of these. There's a question here about does anonymization require a legal basis? i.e. specific consent, legitimate interest, etc. And I think it, it does. The process of anonymization is processing of personal data to make it anonymous data. And therefore, it, it does need to come with the GDPR. So we need to have some legal basis to carry out uh, that anonymization. Uh, and then there was another question about, is there a rule of thumb about uh, aggregating data to work out how many records need to be aggregated for it to be anonymized. I don't know whether Rob or Min are aware of any guidance from the ICO or the DPC on numbers, but there have been cases in the UK mainly to do with freedom of information, where I think, um, you know, having a, a quotes aggregated something like three to five records was considered to be sufficiently anonymized. I think, again, it's that sort of situation where context is everything and you do need to know exactly what type of data you're talking about and how many different data fields there are that you are then aggregating. So um, I would caution you to just say, great, if I've got three, that's sufficient. I, I think you do need to look at it quite broadly in the context of the data that you're processing. So um, I'm going to call time there, I think, because we are a couple of minutes away from the end of the, the scheduled slot. Uh, I hope you would join me in thanking both Min and Rob for a fantastic presentation and um, responding to many of your questions, the remainder of them, we will send you out uh, answers by email after today. So please do watch out. We will be sending you a copy of the slides and the recording. Uh, 
thank you so much for spending time with us today. And uh, please do join us for our next webinar, which is on the 28th of April, being run by our colleagues Leone, Kirsten and Camille. It's on AdTech. And if you haven't yet signed up, please sign up shortly. So thank you very much from me. Min, Rob, do you want to say goodbye? Farewell. <laughs> thank you, everyone. I hope it was useful and thank you for attending. Okay, then. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.